the next uh, week, eight days, uh, to have one of the stars of this recent scattering amplitude program visiting us. Uh, Jacob got his PhD at Princeton in 2011, working with Nima Karni Ahmed. He was at the Harvard Society of Fellows for the next three years, and since since then has been assistant professor at NBI. Um, he's a pioneer in on-shell methods, uh, on-shell recursion, introducing Grassmannian techniques to this whole this whole field. Uh, since then, been doing a ton of things, including. Uh, reorganizing all sorts of ways of, of looking at this problem, of extracting physical predictions uh, from our favorite field theories. He is an author of a book on these uh, Grassmannian methods. He, what you're controlling over three million euros in funding right now, oh. between a combination of this Wilhelm uh, Foundation as well as a recent ERC starting grant, and uh, and he's got he's got I think a, a lot to say to a lot of people. So. We're uh, very, very happy to have him around, and uh, I'll let him get started. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, this is one of my favorite places to, uh, to, to be and to, to, to visit with so many great colleagues and interesting conversations. Um, the, what the story I'm going to tell you today is really, um, from a bird's eye view, um, the things that have that uh, get me excited about scattering amplitudes. It's more personally themed, so I'll, I won't do a very good job of surveying the entire field or all the things, there are many things that I won't have time to talk about, but I wanna give you a basic idea of the kinds of ingredients that have really changed in the last uh, 20 years or so um, in our understanding of the basics of quantum field theory. And the talk, and I think also that a lot of this progress will be divided into a few, into some kind of simpler parts. Ba there's been a tremendous amount of advancement in our understanding of the kinds of basic ingredients that go into scattering amplitudes and some simplicity. This is related to the simplicity of tree level amplitudes, but also related to the ingredients that are needed for ta talking about perturbative um, predictions in general quantum field theories. And in particular for massless quantum field theories in four dimensions, there's been tremendous progress related to some interesting mathematics um, that I spoke about here about a year ago. Um, then I'll talk about the, the progress we've made in constructing loop into grands. And I wish I had more time because there's been a lot of recent, very recent progress that I won't really have more time than mention in passing. And then give you an idea of where things are going in the future um, with loop integration. Some of you may have been at a uh, seminar a month ago where I gave many more details about the current state of the art of loop integration. Anyway, there's a lot of material to cover, so let's get things started. But, but before I do, I really want to start with uh, setting the stage and um, you know, just kind of give you an idea of the kind of simplicity that um, I think we have been, we've, we've discovered in quantum field theory and that we're trying to explain. So of course, as we teach our students, and as everybody in this room probably learned once in school, you know, quantum field theories are defined by some Lagrangian and we learn the method for computing predictions by according to the path integral, that we sum over all the histories, at least for perturbative scattering amplitudes in a perturbative regime, that this is how we make predictions. We start with Lagrangian, we calculate things. And of course, this is correct. It leads to good predictions, they're right. Um, and in this perturbative setup, we organize our, our predictions according to the loop expansion. So this is not quite an S matrix, but it is a ratio of S matrices in massive QED. The leading order, we basically define the quantum field theory this way. Um, and at one loop, we still assign this to every one of our students in a quantum field theory course. It's a week-long homework assignment of a numerator algebra, an integral that you have to do as one diagram, and you get this, the next prediction. And of course, you can keep going. And as we all know, everyone in this room knows very well, this works. This matches experiment to amazing precision. It's unquestionably the most precisely tested idea in all of science. I'm not reviewing this because I you know, I, I want to emphasize that what we understand of quantum field theory is correct. But I also want to remind you of some of the challenges here. The, look at these time stamps. You know, between the one week homework assignment that we all did in, in graduate school, you get an integral that even Mathematica still doesn't know how to do, until, unless you know some tricks, and then the answer is one. Okay, the next prediction took 10 years to compute. It's only five diagrams. It's really not that hard, but it took 10 years and you get that. 
And now it's known semi-analytically up to five loops, or I think all but one diagram, maybe. Um, but anyway, these kinds of things, the simplicity of this prediction is at great odds with the difficulty that we have to, that, you know, the, the efforts that we go through to make these predictions. And this is truly ubiquitous in quantum field theory. And it becomes worse with, with quantum field theories that are more relevant to, the, you know, to gauge theories, for example. And in fact, I think it's a generally true statement that all but the simplest, and by this I mean the most trivial predictions, those involving the fewest numbers of states at the very lowest orders of perturbation theory, are either intractable or inscrutable. I mean, even with computers that are getting very good, so there's tons of more predictions we can make at the LHC you know, for, for processes that people need. But if a computer's doing it and no human being could ever look at the formula, I don't think we really understand it. And yet every single time we look into it, the predictions we actually make are mocking us by their simplicity. And there's a classic example of this that I think I'm obliged as an amplitudologist to review in the beginning of, of uh, general audience talks, um, which is the story of predictions for collider experiments. And this process where you have two gluons creating four jets is something that was literally once considered intractable, beyond the reach of, uh, of conceivable predictions from theory. And I mean that in a very literal sense. There was a paper in 1984 where they were outlining the problems for that to be faced by a superconducting superclider, where they said that the cross sections for two to four processes have never been calculated, and their complexity is such they might not be evaluated in the foreseeable future. They thought it was actually hopeless. And yet this happens millions of times a second at the LHC. You need these predictions. Now, of course, there are a few ways of motivating people better than telling them that something's impossible. And sure enough, within a few months of this, um, two physicists at Fermilab put their backs into it um, and added up all of these hundreds of Feynman diagrams using supercomputers at the time. Um, I spoke to one of them recently, and he still has the code for this. Um, and as soon as they got the answer, they used supersymmetry. They used all sorts of tricks. And as soon as they got the answer, they rushed it to publication. It's such a beautifully short abstract. The cross-section for two to four gluon scattering is given in a form suitable for fast calculations. They have the experimentalists in mind. Now, of course, this is just a sum of a bunch of Feynman diagrams. It's a leading order prediction. So it's just a big rational function, and this is what it looked like. Okay? Lots of coefficient matrices, lots of terms. Basically, this is the entire paper, is this eight-page formula. But the reason why I love it is because of this quixotic optimism that they chose to end it with. See? Furthermore, we hope to obtain a simple analytic form for the answer, making our result not only an experimentalist, but also a theorist delight. And, you know, I, we may never know exactly what, what made them optimistic that they could find a simple answer, because they didn't have one at this time. But within six months, they stumbled upon a guess that they checked numerically that must have exceeded their wildest dreams. Um, and this is the paper that they're much more famous for, Park and Taylor. So they guessed that that eight-page formula was equal to this simple rational expression in notation that's actually very much older than them, but that they didn't know at the time. But the reason why this formula is so amazing is not just that it simplifies eight pages down to one term. Anyway, they didn't prove it. They just checked it numerically. But it's because you can't look at this formula without guessing that it has to apply for the production of any number of particles whatsoever. So it leads to a one-term prediction for this particular process. And, um, and if you're not impressed by this, let me remind you that when two gluons create 50 gluons at leading order in perturbation theory, we're talking about more Feynman diagrams than there are atoms in the universe. Okay. And they're predicting that it's just this one term. And I think in recent years, we, can, we, have, we understand this kind of simplicity. And I hope to convince you in, part of this, in the rest of this talk that this kind of simplicity isn't some artifact about leading order of perturbation theory. Um, if I had more time, I would love to review the story about how we can prove this today. It took about 20 years from this guess to its proof. But what motivates me is to try to, when we discover simplicity like this, this, this is really an indictment on the way we understand and we think about quantum field theory, if it's at such odds with this kind of the simplicity of the predictions. I think it's safe to say that if, if we are continuously shocked by the predictions we make for experiments, that we don't really understand the theory. Okay? I mean, of course, we know how to calculate things, we can put it on a supercomputer, but if we are, every single time we do that, we are amazed by the answer we get, Come on. And so I, I, what motivates me is to try to understand the simplicity, explain it, and exploit it to go further. Um, 
So, the, so another way of phrasing this, motivating my, what, what's uh, uh, a lot of the developments in amplitudes is to uh, try to answer the question, to what extent can quantum field theory be recast without any reference to gauge redundancies, virtual particles, ghosts, or any of the other unobservable baggage that I think we now understand is responsible for this problem with the Park-Taylor prediction. Um, it's carrying around all of this unphysical, unobservable data that causes all the problems. Um, and the answer is, is that, at least in perturbative quantum field theories, the answer is basically all of it. We can now reproduce perturbation theory without reference to unphysical processes. Um, and in fact, we're getting really good at it. And the, the, the rest of this talk is really outlining how this, this works in practice. So the first step is really to talk about, is, it was a revolution in our understanding of tree amplitudes, these rational functions, um, and also the functions that are built out of tree amplitudes. Because these things turn out to be the key ingredient to being able to predict, to make perturbative predictions in any quantum field theory. And there's been a ton of really interesting ideas that I'll only pass over briefly here. And then the next big thing was to understand that you could separate the problem of perturbation theory into constructing loop integrands, which are very much more like trees, the rational functions, from loop integrals, which are horrible transcendental functions that scare us still today. And we're getting a little better at going from integrands to integrals. And I wish, well, I spoke about this in February. But, um, but anyway, if you separate this problem from constructing a loop integrand, which is finite, well-defined, you don't, you don't need to worry about divergences or normalization from loop integration. And at the very end, I'll briefly describe some of the recent advances in loop integration. OK, so if you like the Latin on this, the simplicity is a sign of truth, like this, there's an old Greek saying here. That means the uh, simplicity of design makes it easy to build. And it turns out to be a really good idea to focus our attention on the simplest kinds of ingredients and just what, what if, we are forbid, if we forbid ourselves from talking about virtual particles, ghosts, or anything that's not observable directly in an experiment, what can we talk about? And it turns out that this leads to pretty much um, all of the recent advances in, in our understanding of um, quantum field theory. So the key idea is to talk about this. Functions that can be defined out of scattering amplitudes, full observable things that only depend on observable states, and things that are built, that are built out of them. So the simplest example of an on-shell function, that's what I'm calling this on-shell function, is um, a full S matrix. But if you knew any S matrices whatsoever, you could glue them together in a way that's dictated by basic principles of quantum mechanics. Name, so this is not a Feynman diagram. This is an on-shell particle. It's something that satisfied p squared equals m squared. Um, and it's, you can think about this in the old-fashioned way. This was motivated as a residue of a, of a Feynman diagram. You, know, you have some off-shell propagator that you put on shell. But I want to think about it more as just from, I don't want to define it as derived from something off-shell. I want to talk about this as just intrinsically well-defined. And it is. See, because if this particle is a, is a physically observable state, then it can propagate arbitrary distances in space and time. And that means that if the quantum field theory is local, that these amplitudes must be independent. And so the meaning of this picture as a function must be the, multi the, the two things multiplied. And because this particle is not being observed, qu basic I quantum mechanics tells us we have to introduce a complete set of states, which means Integrating over the on-shell phase space that's allowed, um, and summing over all the licities, all the quantum colors, all the other labels that could possibly describe this state. So this is the general definition of an on-shell function in any number of dimensions in any quantum field theory. And it's not just for this particular picture, but it's for any graph of amplitudes. So we can construct arbitrary graphs. And when people started drawing these things, they were defined as residues of loop amplitudes, but there's no reason to define them as derived objects from something off-shell. They have an intrinsic, well-defined meaning um, if you knew some uh, built out of gauge invariant um, meaningful observable data. OK. <clears throat> and it's been known since the early 90s that if you knew these functions, this class of functions, um, especially if you thought about them in the previous picture as residues of amp amplitudes, that you could use these functions to reconstruct perturbation theory to any order in any quantum field theory. So this class of, of rational, gauge-invariant, physically meaningful objects 
can be really used to define a perturbative quantum field theory completely. Um, and as long as you make certain caveats about uh, regularization schemes or what dimension you're working in, this is truly a robust statement. Um, uh, captures QCD as well as any other theory you could care to think about. <clears throat> but something magical happens for massless theories in four dimensions. And I wish I had more time. I could derive this for you pretty quickly, but, but the, all you need to know is that something the, what, what is special about a massless theory in four dimensions is that the three particle S matrix, um, well first it's zero, but its analytic continuation is unique and it is fixed to all orders of perturbation theory by basically Poincaré invariance. Um, and so, um, so there is a unique all orders three particle S matrix for any theory, massless theory in four dimensions. And so if you have a theory with one state and it's parity conjugate, you, you can like say pure Yang Mills, then you can draw little pictures like this, and there's meanings. You have to identify which helicities are involved in the amplitude, so you have to decorate it. And if you have more states, you might have to decorate things like this in masses QED. Um, but the meaning of this amplitude, as a, or at least its analytic continuation, is uniquely fixed to all orders. That is what is special. And, and you probably know that maximal supersymmetry has played a big role in the amplitudes business in recent years. And I want to emphasize right now that the only role, the only reason why maximal supersymmetry is nice is because there's a unique, you don't need to specify the states. There's a unique amplitude of this type and a unique amplitude of that type, both in n equals four and n equals eight. And so just to really rub in the fact that there's nothing special about, or that supersymmetry isn't playing the role you might have thought it did, as far as these pictures and these, these functions are concerned, there's absolutely no benefit to n equals one supersymmetry. N equals four and N equals eight are beautifully simple. Anything less than maximal supersymmetry, it's just as bad as no supersymmetry. Um, and that's because in N equals two, you still have two states that you have to carry around. It's just combinatorially, it's identical to having no supersymmetry at all. Um, so, but there is something very nice about maximal supersymmetry. But whether or not you have supersymmetry, this is a meaningful picture in massless quantum electrodynamics. This is a meaningful picture in QCD. This is a meaningful picture in N equals four or N equals eight. And these meaningful pictures that are built without any reference to virtual particles or ghosts or anything like this can be used to define the perturbative quantum field theory in general. Now, I wish I had more time. I could really, actually, every sub part of this talk I could give a mini course on. But, um, but one thing I want to just you know, mention here is that there is something else beautiful about these, these functions. Not only can you do they define the theory and they're well-defined all orders, but in the last few years, we've discovered a connection to, some, to a pretty surprising area of mathematics that has led to an enormous amount of uh, fruit in both, in both sides of this correspondence. And the basic, what, what was discovered recently is that any one of these pictures in four dimensions for massless quantum field theories, nothing to do with supersymmetry, nothing to do with anything else. So just any, like the standard model, for example, can be, these functions can be calculated as the volume forms really is the more precise statement, but volume forms over a certain um, manifold, a certain sub-variety of a Grassmannian uh, uh, manifold. And I wish I had more time to kind of walk you through this, but I did, this is more or less the theme of the talk a year that I gave here a year ago. But the, the punchline is that for every one of these on-shell diagrams and functions, there is a particular sub-manifold of some of the space of k by n matrices. This is the Grassmannian of k-planes and n-dimensions, um, and a particular volume form that depends very much on the theory. And this correspondence translates a lot of things that are interesting to both sides. Volume-preserving diffeomorphisms, which in particular include cluster coordinate mutations. Turns out that all these spaces are cluster varieties. Um, these correspond to physical symmetries and identities among these functions. And functional uh, relations among these things are, can be understood homologically on the right-hand side. So, I mean, I wish I had time to tell you about this in more detail, um, but this is just some example. And so you read, look at a picture like this and you get some particular span of some manif sub-manifold. The coordinates on the space, which happen to be cluster coordinates, can be read off from the graph, which is beautiful. Um, and this volume form depends on the theory. Um, um, and I really won't review this very much, but one important consequence of this is that um, <coughs> the, 
is that the number of these coordinates, this, the, the degree of this volume form, depends on the graph in this way. It's the total number of edges of the graph, including the external edges, which I haven't had time to define, minus the number of vertices. This grows with the edges of the graph, which means that as you grow, draw more and more complicated graphs, the number of coordinates of this volume form grows arbitrarily. And I'm sure some of you are thinking that, uh, that yet the dimension of the, of the Grassmannian does not grow arbitrarily. And so eventually, these volume forms have to be degenerate. In fact, almost all graphs correspond to degenerate volume forms. So there's a finite number of, of non-degenerate volume forms. Those are called reduced graphs. And every other graph can be computed in terms of reduced ones. So, there's a, so, so you learn immediately that there is a finite number of, of fundamental building blocks for any quantum field theory in four dimensions. And also, these kinds of identities, these functional <coughs> coordinate mutations, for example, correspond to um, active symmetry transformations on, for the physicists. And it turns out that in the case of planar theories of maximum supersymmetry, these, these um, uh, volume-preserving diffeomorphisms exactly correspond to the infinite dimensional symmetry called the Yangian. Um, but these symmetries, this infinite dimensional symmetry, exists for non-planar theories, for non-supersymmetric theories. It's just volume-preserving diffeomorphisms. It's infinite dimensional because a subgroup of diffeomorphisms is probably infinite dimensional if it's not zero. Um, so the so every <coughs> these building blocks in a even in the standard model have enjoy infinite dimensional symmetries, and it does not necessarily imply that amplitudes enjoy infinite dimensional symmetries, but certainly the building blocks do. So. So some of the implications for physicists from this correspondence is that the number of building blocks is finite. Is finite. Um, any massless theory in four dimensions. Every one of these building blocks enjoys infinite dimensional symmetries. And I don't know, we don't have special names of them. Whether or not they're relevant for physics is another question. Um, and they include simultaneously, they, they talk both about um, uh, cuts of amplitudes and integrands and integrals all at the same time. And so it turns out that, that you, for a growing class of quantum field theories, it is possible to directly compute loop integrands as in, in terms of these pictures, in terms of these onshell functions. But there are huge and low-lying open questions, both for mathematics and physics. We know that there are a finite number on general grounds. How many? And if you're, I was here about a year ago, and it really hasn't advanced much since, since I gave that talk. But in very few cases, we've been able to count them outside of the case of planar maximum supersymmetry. Um, but it's a very well-defined question. And we have, uh, uh, and it's the kind of question that I expect um, we, can, we can answer with the help of some mathematicians. Um, but we have, otherwise, we're resorting to brute force methods, and we have very limited knowledge. Also, do these infinite dimensional symmetries have anything to do with scattering amplitudes? In the case of maximum supersymmetry, yes, this Yangian is known to be a symmetry of amplitudes in a qualified sense. Um, and it's suggestive that maybe other quantum field theories have these infinite dimensional symmetries. Um, and in fact, I just can't resist. So um, uh, on the subject of these asymptotic symmetries, I should point out that in, recent, in the last couple of years, um, different groups of people have come up with extremely different logic for suggesting that massless quantum field theories in four dimensions might enjoy infinite dimensional symmetries, corresponding to the asymptotic image of, um, of uh, 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 Poincaré invariants, basically, off at infinity this BMS group, and extensions of it to maybe for, to have supersymmetric versions and conformal generations. And uh, it was on the, the day where we lost, where we tragically lost Stephen Hawking. It's, I was a, uh, a privilege to write one of the last papers to help to collaborate on one of the last papers he wrote, going towards this idea of maybe making sense of these, of these enhanced symmetries, con their connection to on-shell functions and scattering amplitudes. But it's been long suggested that if, if there's something nice about, say, max, you know, that there's no, the known symmetries of, say, maximum supergravity don't protect it from being finite, uh, from it from ultraviolet divergences. And so if it turns out that n equals 8 is finite, it would imply that there are more symmetries than just the ones that we know about. And this is a candidate for more symmetries. So maybe it has some implications for proving the finiteness of n equals 8. 
Um, and it would be wonderful to, sh to show that this, that these infinite dimensions, that these, that this BMS group, this um, asymptotic symmetries um, thought, proposed by Strominger and, and collaborators actually has some connection to the Yangian in the case of n equals four. That would go a long way to convincing people that these are real aspects of real quantum field theories. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about these these um, functions and what we know about these, these these geometries in the case of maximum supersymmetry. So notice the, that I'm drawing graphs without arrows on them because this, these are diagrams that are only relevant for maximum supersymmetry where I don't need to tell you the states. And there are basically two relations among the diagrams, which probably, which means that you can draw very different looking diagrams that are actually the same function. Um, and you know you can see that. A, diagram like this is actually the same as this function here is the same as this function here through a very complicated sequence of uh, or not visually clear sequence of moves. And it's probably this reason that the diagrams are so redundant that people stopped drawing them um, early on, which is a shame because if they, because around this time that physicists stopped drawing pictures like this in their papers is when they started appearing in papers by mathematicians like Alexander Posnikov. Um, who pointed out that, that the space of diagrams that are invariant under these kinds of moves leave invariant a very nice combinatorial characteristic, namely a permutation that's defined in a very simple way. You start at the outside of the graph and you walk and you go inward into the graph. And every time you see a blue vertex, you turn left, or you turn right. And every time you see a white vertex, you turn left. This will land you somewhere on the outside of the diagram, so it defines a permutation. It's very easy to see that these moves leave this permutation invariant. And um, the qualification that I need to give is that for reduced graphs, um, I haven't defined reducibility yet, but or I won't. But anyway, so this is um, the converse is true. That if two graphs have the same permutation label and they're both reduced, then they are actually related by moves. Um, and so it turns out that that these that that for a theory like planar maximum supersymmetry, you can actually get rid of the graphs entirely. The entire theory is dictated. All these building blocks are dictated by permutations. And for tree amplitudes, and I didn't have time to tell you about this, but this is the origin of the, what's called the BCFW recursion relations. But that this kind of picture, which was originally derived in terms of pictures like this, once translated into permutations, is just a combinatorial operation. And it turns out that to all orders of perturbation theory for any process in maximum planar or n equals 4 maximum supersymmetry, the entire theory is just combinatorial. You don't need to draw a single graph. If you know the permutation, you know the function, you're done. And this allows us to uh, dramatically extend our predictive reach in this quantum field theory. And so in the case of planar n equals 4, there's kind of a, I think, more or less understood um, uh, a complete picture of what's going on here. And it's, and it's simple because there's combinatorics on all sides and there's geometry that's understood on all sides. So we have pictures like this that compute scattering amplitudes in, in this particular quantum field theory. They're entirely dictated by these permutations, which in fact code, encode certain kind of cluster varieties inside the Grassmannian. And from this, you can compute the function in question. You can talk about the geometry here. <coughs> and functional relations are homological, and everything is very beautiful. And it became so clear that I think so, so, so many things fell into place that I think that a few years ago warranted writing a book about it. So this is um, written with two, two mathematicians and four of us physicists. Um, um, that came out, I guess, last year. And in fact, there's even computer code available for it. And just, uh, I couldn't resist a fun, random fun comment. Those of, um, for those of you who have not already written books with publishing houses, but you know, they, their lawyers are very serious. So in the book contract for this book, there was, I think, a seven page contract. <coughs> and it outlined every conceivable contingency. And the one that I love the most is um, that the authors will get 50% of the proceeds if it's for any dramatization or documentary um, <laughs> or if it's made into a film. Um, so the only question is who will play the Grassmannian? Um, okay. So as I, told, as I mentioned uh, last year when I was here, there, there are some natural extensions beyond this kind of complete knowledge I think we have for planar maximum supersymmetry. And that is to talk about the this, this space of these objects, these building blocks for theories with less supersymmetry or theories that are not planar with maximum supersymmetry. Um, and there's been a fairly successful experimental approach to this, namely just draw the diagrams and see how many different ones 
there are, and what are the relations. And um, for the sake of time, and also because I told you the story in much more detail a year ago, I'll kind of pass over this. But what we know is that in the case of 2 by n matrices, everything is more or less um, understood, at least the basis of these kinds of things. There's no new ge geometric structures to um, talk about. And in the case of 3 by 6, so the gross money of three planes in n dimensions, there's only one bit of data that's known, which is a complete classification of cluster varieties that are defined as submanifolds in the space of three planes in six dimensions. And I'm, and I'm still waiting for some mathematician to tell me that they already knew this, but it turns out that there are exactly 24 top dimensional cluster varieties. And for a physicist, this means that there are 10 different functions that they could possibly care about. And we showed by basically brute force construction that these 10 different functions are all expressible in terms of these three. So that means that to all, so what does this mean to a physicist? This means that to all orders of perturbation theory in a theory of maximum supersymmetry, this is the same for n equals four as, as it is for n equals eight, that these six particle amplitudes have three possible rational coefficients sitting in front of polylogs. And so as you go higher and higher in order of perturbation theory, you get more and more complicated transcendental functions, but all of the rational function part of any prediction to all orders is built out of these three functions. Okay. So let's talk about perturbation theory, and especially before integration. So, and the key insight here um, about perturbation theory is to realize that you can postpone the horrors and the difficulties of loop integration and renormalization and regularization by just talking about the sum of Feynman diagrams the rational functions that we get from adding, um, from adding up Feynman diagrams. And because they're rational functions, they're a heck of a lot more like, um, like tree level amplitudes. And in particular, it means, and in particular, we have physical information about all of the cut structure. A pole of a loop integrand, a perturbative loop integrand, is corresponds to putting some Feynman propagator on shell. So it starts looking like one of these functions that I was drawing before. And and moreover, if they're a rational function, you can, you can imagine that there are nice tricks to computing them. For example, if, they're all, if it's entirely dictated by its poles, you could imagine some complex structure deformation and using Cauchy's theorem to reconstruct it. And, and sure enough, in a large and increasing class of quantum field theories, this has now been proven. Um, I would bet a year's salary that, this is, that a formula like this is true in any quantum field theory. Um, and there are a lot of technical reasons why it's very hard to check that it's true. But, um, but uh, every, every few months, a, a broader class of quantum field theories is now provable. And so you might think that we're more or less done. This now expresses a L-loop integrand in terms of pictures like this that are all built out of trees. <coughs> and so, so long as a, some sort of recursion like this exists, you just put it on the computer and now you can compute everything. And every integrand you could compute now has all the beautiful symmetries of, of the tree amplitudes, which you know now are infinite dimensional, and things are, are very nice. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work out like that, and the reason is because of all the problems of doing integration. Um, namely, the meaning of an integrand is not especially, well, it's, there, is not, there is not especially strong meaning for an integrand in a non-planar quantum field theory, or one that requires dimensional regularization or some sort of other um, scheme dependence. Um, and so there's only really justifiably a meaningful notion of what the integral is. And in a theory with massless particles, a loop integral is almost always divergent, infrared divergent. So you need to talk about these regularizations. And you need to have some sort of way of taking these terms and doing these integrals. And unfortunately, nobody knows how to do any of that yet. So whether or not we understand how to do recursion in QCD, um, it's a bit moot at the moment because we don't know how to take the output of this recursion and do any integrals or compute anything. And someday, I think, and in fact, increasingly in, in the last few months, I, I'm really starting to believe this is a better way of doing loop integration. Um, but there are some serious challenges to it. So I think that in 10 years' time, we'll look back, and this will be the right way of computing things in perturbation theory. But today, it's just a mechanism for us to check that we've got the right answer. Because we don't know how to take this form of the answer and compute anything that people care about. Yeah. Can you spend a, s a second talking about the difference between the form of the integrands you get this way versus, you know, some naive Feynman diagram? Yeah. Well, so why is this trickier to integrate than, you know? So the, the, 
Um, I guess I do have it there. So the, 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 tri the main thing is that um, this gives you a uh, form with, as a rational function of loop momenta, and it has lots of propagators of the form L minus complex point P squared, which is, which is, which is a spurious pole. Um, this is a, pole, it's a factor in the denominator that cancels out in the sum. But these spurious poles prevent you from having a rigorous definition of an I epsilon prescription for these things. Um, so, and, uh, and it also, well, it makes it much more confusing to do things like um, mass regularization or any of the other kinds of regularization tricks we'd like to use. So, um, I mean, there are some cases where this has been worked out, but um, being a little less generous than I should be, the, uh, the cases in which we really understand this are cases where it reproduces, it collapses back into a, form, a case that we already understand. So um, there's still kind of a fundamental obstruction to our understanding. But I think if we get past that, this is the right way to do everything. Uh, I don't know, it's easy to pr make predictions like that. Anyway, a much more useful strategy actually predates all of this and is what actually led to our understanding everything I told you about in the last, in the first part of this talk which is um, under the edifice of what's called generalized unitarity. And you have uh, one of the co-creators you know, here locally, though I think today he is in Mainz. Um, and the basic idea is similar. I mean, the, the foundational idea is that a loop, we should compute loop integrands, and loop integrands are rational functions. And that means that provided you have some bound on the space of rational functions, namely the polynomial degree in the numerator and a dimension cutoff so that you don't have arbitrary numbers of propagators, um, the space of rational functions is finite dimensional. It's a vector space. And that means that we can um, take any observable you might care to compute and e express it at the integrand level into a basis of canonical integrands. And there are tons of good reasons for doing this. For one, your canonical basis of loop integrands, you get to integrate once for all quantum field theories. So you can tabulate it and reuse it for many processes. That has huge practical value. But also, you can spend a lot of time thinking about this basis and seeing whether or not there are nice properties about the basis. And now the coefficients of this, of the, the way you express an, uh, an amplitude you care about into this basis is by computing cuts. And so you know that the coefficients of, of, the, of these integrands are exactly the rational functions I told you about them in the first part of the talk. So um, there's a lot of really nice things. And, it, and this is a truly general strategy. This works as long as you make the appropriate um, caveats about, or you allow for the appropriate caveats about dimensional regularization, this works for any quantum field theory in any number of dimensions. Um, okay, so let's see how much of the, the beauty of tree amplitude survives for loop integrands. In this. So of course, take this Park-Taylor example. I think this is the, an archetype for um, the kind of simplicity we expect. But we know that this is just a leading order prediction of quantum field theory. So we know that it needs to get corrected. And by expanding this into a canonical basis of integrands, it's been, it was known, it was found in about 1997 that the first correction to this is a relatively simple sum of, of integrands here. And the difference between an integrand and an integral at one loop is pretty trivial because we can basically do every one of these integrals without any problems. But starting at two loops, there are tons of loop integrals that nobody knows how to do yet. And so there's a really a much bigger distinction between a loop integrand and an integral. But so be it. We've already decided to talk about loop integrands. And you, the next order of this, again, the strategy is very clear. You choose an arbitrary basis that's complete, and you fix the coefficients by saying that the, co that the cuts match field theory. And this was done through a kind of heroic effort by Christian Verdu in 2009, chose his basis, and he wrote down the all multiplicity closed formula for this expression. Actually, it was the parity even part, just to be clear. Um, very relatively compact, and that does not look especially nice. But within a few months of this, um, we found the all loop recursion relations, and my collaborators and I were able to guess and check a simpler formula, namely that. Um, okay? This was not found by choosing a base. In fact, it wasn't even found by any systematic strategy. It was guessed, and we verified it against the uh, output of the recursion relations. And in fact, we got pretty good at it. So within a few months of that, we guessed the three-loop version of this. But I want to I want to emphasize that that when when these results were found, these nice compact expressions for loop integrands for this particular process, these were guessed and checked, very much like the the, the first line, like Park and Taylor originally did. 
Um, we had some machinery to verify our guess, but we didn't have any systematic logic for guessing things like this. And what's changed in the last few months, and what I, what, um, one of the themes of the talk I gave here last month was that we now understand systematically how to make these guesses. This is no longer a guess. We can derive formulas like this. I understand the simplicity. And in fact, it's ubiquitous. It's easy to show that formulas like this for the loop integrands are, exist for all amplitudes in all quantum field theories. Massive, massless, any number of dimensions, supersymmetry, no supersymmetry, whatever. Formulas like this are easy now to construct. And um, I wish I had more time to talk about this. This is something I spoke about last month. <laughs> um, but part of the insight that's changed in the last six months, really, because this is a new understanding, um, is, is that it is a good idea to use, to um, uh, allow yourself um, to give up some of the simplicities that you might have expected in maximum supersymmetry. For example, power counting. If you allow for slightly worse power counting, everything simplifies, it turns out. And so the traditional formulation of n equals of maximum supersymmetry, for example, you might have heard of the no triangle hypothesis, which is that you can compute any amplitude in terms of boxes where the coefficients are these kinds of sums of pictures like this. Um, <clears throat> and this always bothered me for a couple reasons. First, because these integrals are not matching field theory one term by term. They're matching it on a parity symmetrized contour of integration, but also because your basis is incomplete and you're you don't care because these pentagon integrals that you're ignoring, um, are all, you can all make them integrate to zero. So there's some simplicity at the integrated level that wasn't there at the integrand level. And that always bothered me. <coughs> and it turns out that there's an easy way to fix this, which is just to allow yourself worse power counting. As soon as you do that, you get rid of all of the over-completeness of the integrand basis. And you now have a complete basis of integrands that include some triangles, which um, you know, you might have thought you didn't need, but of course you can get, you can include them if you'd like. And there's many magical aspects of this. For example, it turns out that boxes with triangle power counting are all, sorry, up to contact terms are actually all um, infrared finite. And so the only infrared divergent pieces are the in, in, uh, are these integrands in your basis. And it allows you to separate out the infrared divergence pieces from the finite infrared finite parts in a beautiful way that exponential that allows you to compute lots of the finite observables without reference to in divergent integrals. Okay, I, um, there's a lot more. There's a lot more to that story. At two loops, it turned out very easy to, to construct the same kind of procedure. You start with a complete basis of integrands, and you can indeed construct any loop integrand in n, in n equals four by just decorating it with the appropriate cuts, um, and we checked this to 14 particles in, uh, against, BC, uh, against BCFW recursion. Um, and um, yeah, let me skip over some of this. There's, it, it turns out that this kind of separation of infrared divergent and infrared finite is possible and to make manifest at the integrand level of two loops, um, which has some nice implications for calculating finite observables. But I'm no longer convinced that these are general properties of even n equals four. And I'm also no longer convinced that this is the right strategy. It, this, these papers, if you read these papers, required a lot more ingenuity and cleverness than I would have liked. And if you had gone to my talk last month, you would have learned that as long as you're willing to give up optimal power counting, this basically is trivial. Um, and indeed, we've now constructed a complete basis through three loop orders, actually. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. Um, so. For non-planar quantum field theories, um, and what we did, we constructed it in four dimensions. Anyway, and I think that this has some interesting um, uh, pot potential implications for uh, for the challenge for for constructing n equals eight integrands, which has been a, a, a big obstacle to checking the finiteness of n equals eight. Um, of course, doing the integrals and finding out the critical dimensions is another obstacle, which is very serious. But but um, but constructing the integrands to has been quite a challenge too. So, um, and I think that actually, this construction of loop integrands for n equals eight, if it would work at all, um, it will. It will work eventually. But if a more optimistic version works, um, it would have some good implications for integrating too. All right. So I want to finish this part about loop integrands with kind of um, the benchmark, which has been the historic benchmark, and for very good reasons. And I'll tell you about the reasons in a, in a moment here. 
But just as a, a benchmark for the, our predictive reach in this particular nice, particularly nice quantum field theory of planar maximum supersymmetry, just two to two scattering. Um, you know, how far have people gone? And it's um, not only is it a nice benchmark for physicists to care about, but it's even reached the popular imagination. Here's <laughs> Sheldon Cooper of the Big Bang Theory, a television uh, show in America, a comedy show. He's computing, I think, five, six, and seven loops. It's a little confusing, but he's <laughs> adding them together. Um, uh, there. <coughs> so this has been kind of a standard benchmark for a long time. And at one loop, this amplitude is just one scalar integral. It's very simple. At two loops, this was found at the same time as all one loop amplitudes in 1997, um, using this basic idea of writing down a basis of integrands and fixing it by cuts. In fact, three loops came about in 2005, probably could have been done sooner. Um, four loops, 2007, this is the full four loop answer. Five loops, um, took a little bit more cleverness, but took but happened pretty quickly thereafter. By uh, JJ and uh, got on board, and in fact, within a, within a short period of time after this, although it is hard to figure out the exact date, um, got six loops as well. It wasn't published till a few years later, so I was just, um, <laughs> and I think I mistakenly cited it at 2007. Anyway, um, at some point after 2007, they had the unpublished result for a long time. <laughs> and some of us reproduced it. But it took, it, it really, this method of just choosing an arbitrary basis and fixing all the coefficients, um, oh, it, it started to become quite a challenge to implement at, at beyond six loops. And um, it turns out that we, that um, around, I guess, what was the year, 2011, we figured out another way of fixing these things, not by cuts, but by more general principles, more bootstrap-like principles although this was before the conformal bootstrap became popular, but more basic properties of self-consistency allow you to determine this, this function uniquely, at least at seven loops. Um, one motivation for going, so a couple of years ago we pushed this to eight loops, and one reason why we decided that it was worth pushing it to eight loops was because the method as stated to get to seven loops broke. Um, and it turned out it was a very efficient method for exactly one case. Um, and uh, anyway, we pushed this more or less using the same method, but with some extra clarification. But within just a, a couple months of, of, our, of, of obtaining the 8-loop amplitude, I'll point out there are some other really good theoretical reasons why this is an interesting question. But within a few months of this, we got good at it. And so we got 9 and 10 loops um, within about 6 months of this. And in fact, Unlike this, which took two weeks of CPU time, um, we got nine and ten loops in a couple days on my laptop. Um, so we're, we've gotten pretty good at it. And I think there are some really intrinsic good reasons why this is a particularly interesting observable in this quantum field theory. Okay, and just to give you an idea of the kind of simplicity that's been achieved here. So this is what this is what Feynman would have told us to do. And by the way, these are super graphs. This was not actually counting number of terms. It's also not counting the number of Feynman diagrams that we normally draw. It's, it's actually the Feynman supergraphs that you draw. And you can see that the number of um, basis elements of your, uh, if you were going to use unitarity, grows pretty large. And it cut a little bit in terms of this conformal correlator, which I wish I had more time to review. But you can see that there's now, there's a, almost a 20 order of magnitude improvement in, um, in the number of terms. In 100,000 terms at 10 loops, is admittedly a scarily large number, but it is a heck of a lot smaller than 10 to the 24. Um, and, it's, and it's the kind of number that a computer can think about. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I don't have a ton of time to really review this, but the basic idea of this bootstrap is that you, you basically forget about matching cuts. And instead, you insist on a really weak consistency condition, which is that the log of the amplitude should be log squared divergence, divergent. We all know this because we know the, the coefficient of this log squared divergent, or one over epsilon squared divergence in dim reg, is the cusp anomalous dimension. And it's the leading divergence of the log of the amplitude. All the other divergences in, an, in a massless quantum field theory um, exponentiate, so they, get, they disappear in the log. Um, and that allows, and it turns out that there is ex that, that criteria alone uniquely fixes the, the, uh, the amplitude through seven loops. What goes wrong at eight loops is that there are, for the first time, 
there are integrals that don't have any divergence at all, these finite integrals. And these are amazingly interesting contributions, not just because they're finite, and so they kind of spoil the method that we had before, but also because they have elliptic contributions. And that would imply that there would be some sort of elliptic contribution to the cusp anomalous dimension in, say, 10 loops. They're finite at 8 loops, would be 10 loops. Which means that it could be that the BES formula that we all know and love for the cusp anomalous dimension for, for n equals 4 might be incomplete. Um, and I, I could, if somebody asks me in the questions uh, at the end of the talk, I'd be happy to explain why I think this is not some can't accident that cancels. <coughs> I think these are things, these are real um, and might have some interesting implications. Okay. But also, it turns out that at this order, you start getting things that are ultraviolet divergent. Um, even with the best, best possible UV behavior we can think of for a, uh, for a theory, in this basis, there are integrands that are ultraviolet divergent. For more particles, this will start happening at six loops. But it, uh, for four particles, it starts happening at eight loops. So the first time you could have an ultraviolet, ultraviolet divergent integrals, it turns out you need them. And so there's some interesting tension between ultraviolet finiteness and uh, polylogarithmic, or polylogarithmicity or, and um, locality. Um, and all of these things get probed at eight loops. Now the real now I would I could tell you that and it's partially true that we really pushed went from eight to ten because we could um, that's kind of true but there's another more intrinsic reason for for why this particular observable should be pushed as high as anybody can possibly push it and that is because it turns out that it actually knows that it, that this particular scattering amplitude well, let's skip over that um, there we go that it's related to the off shell correlator. The correlation function and the amplitude for this four part of this particular observable are exactly, contain exactly the same amount of information. If you know one, you can construct the other. But moreover, this particular correlation function, if you take four particles in the light like limit, you get the four particle amplitude. But if you take five particles in the light like limit, you get the five particle amplitude. In fact, if you take the 10 particles, you get the 10 point amplitudes. In fact, this one correlation function and this one simple quantum field theory knows about the entire scattering, all higher multiplicity processes at lower loops. So if you knew this one observable to high enough loop order, you could extract everything else. And it's safe to say that this is our state of the art in every case that, it, you know, that matters. So, so this, our 10 loop four point amplitude gives us the eight loop six point amplitude. It gives us the six loop ten, you know, uh, eight, point, eight point amplitude. Um, and there's no other method, not unitarity, not recursion, that can, that can match this yet. Um, so I, I think this is pretty promising. And I think that this connection between this four point process and these higher point processes at lower loops is what makes me think that these elliptic contributions that start happening at such high loop order are actually real. Because we know that they're real for these higher multiplicity processes at lower loops. Okay, so in the last few minutes here, I want to um, kind of address the question about whether or not, you know, some of you are probably, there's always some pessimists in the room who might think, naturally, that this, all this beauty at the loop integrand level, surely it can't survive loop integration. And there's a ton of reasons to be wary about loop integration. It's hard, it's always been the hardest step in quantum field theory, I mean, tech, at a technical level. Um, and the methods that we have no matter how good they are, and they are very well developed and very good, I should give them a lot more praise, they are all bad at preserving the symmetries that we expect to find and that we do find for processing. So most, right, because most observables are, have to be computed in terms of thing, integrals that are individually divergent, we need to regulate them. And regularization almost, is almost guaranteed to break all of the beautiful things that you expect to be there for a finite observable. Um, and regularization seems necessary, and it seems that it spoils everything. So it makes it very hard to see if there's any simplicity in the integrated answer. And also, just most integration techniques are complicated, and they spoil, they, they really, um, and they're hard to use. Um, and I think, you know, to be honest with what I've been spending the last six months of my life um, on, you know, at least 20 hours a day is this problem. And I think there's a ton of reasons to be very optimistic. But let me tell you about, you know, just address the elephant in the room. Is there any simplicity to expect? And there's a, 
there is a um, going back to this Park Taylor process. There is a there is a reason to expect that something nice happens. So, for two to four, this six particle process, two to four at next to next to leading order perturbation theory, this was computed um, in 2010 by Del Duca Dur and Smirnov in a truly heroic paper where they took all these divergent integrals, they regulated them, they computed, they recast it in terms of symmetric functions they knew about, and they, and they introduced all sorts of new techniques. It was a really an amazing growth paper. It's like 120 pages. And the 100 pages is on techniques and methods that are extremely uh, impressive and novel, and then the answer is the last 20 pages. So this is that paper, and this is what the answer looks like. So this is the, the first kind of finite test, or test of something uh, in this particular quantum field theory. And this, this, this formula, this 18 page formula, was expressed in terms of functions called Goncharov polylogarithms, which most physicists learned about from this paper. Um, and in particular, some physicists at Brown, um, uh, Mark Spradlin, Anastasia Bolovich, and uh, Christian Vergu, were at Brown and they Googled Goncharov polylogarithms, they wanted to know what they were. And it turns out that Goncharov was a mathematician across the street in the math department, and so they went and knocked on his door and asked him, hey, we've got this formula of all of your polylogarithms, can you help us understand it? And like any respectable mathematician, he wouldn't look at a formula like this. So he told them to go calculate something called the, uh, the symbol. And it turned out that this thing had a, had a two-line symbol. And anyway, it took a few weeks for them to guess then and check that that whole 18-page formula could be expressed on two lines. And this kind of simplicity, I think we have now gotten very good at, at understanding how to get from an integrand to, to these kinds of integrals, or at least we are getting good at it. Um, um, but there's clearly some more simplicity uh, in terms of the functional, the functions that come out of, of the functional form of the predictions that we make for quantum field theory that I think are still remain to be understood and that, I, that um, uh, are keeping me up at night. So just to some, uh, this is, this should be a whole talk in itself, but some of the recent, the reasons for being optimistic about progress in this is that we've really improved our understanding. That trick on the last slide has been, has been systematized and used and exploited to make predictions for this particular process through six loops order now, um, without even knowing the Feynman diagram. Without any integral, integrand integral methods, they can get the right answer up to six loops. This is a completely amazing. And if we want to go from integrand to integral, which is clearly a more versatile approach, um, we're learning all sorts of tricks. Integration by parts, differential equations. We've developed new um, uh, regularization schemes that don't spoil the symmetries that, um, uh, that we care about. And we're finding nearly finite, taking nearly finite integrals, at least for finite observables. And we're starting to explore the implications of this, preserving the, the symmetries we want to preserve through the process of integration and using the right variables to describe the, the physical degrees of freedom in ways that turn out to just dramatically simplify this process of integration. And so there's a ton of work in progress and I hope to come back again soon and tell you all about that. Um, maybe I'll skip this in the interest of time, but uh, in a, in a forthcoming paper, we've made a ton of progress in the case of planar in loop integration, which is what I talked about last February, and sorry, last month. So I want to close with just um, to remind you of the big picture and what the motivation behind this and, and motivation to go forward. Um, I, you know, basically in three parts to divide, to come up with better technology for making predictions which goes hand in hand in finding simplicities and exploiting that simplicity. You know, this is very much helped by finding these kinds of simplicities. And then recasting the basic um, axiomatic framework that we use to make predictions in terms of this, uh, these new kinds of ideas. Um, you know, I don't think, it's not just about calculating things that are, were hard to calculate before that are now becoming easier. It's that I think that being able to calculate when a prediction is simple, if you can calculate it in a way that is simple, I think you have a better understanding of the underlying theory. So I hope I've uh, expressed at least my enthusiasm. And um, I guess I'll close with the, showing you some of the uh, um, wider enthusiasm here. This is a recent cover of New Scientist. This is a, uh, um, a 
performative dance interpretation of angel diagrams. <laughs> um, and uh, people have really loved this geometry of this, that's underlying these uh, on-shell functions here. Um, so some interesting art installations. And but also just completely random in the wild. This is a complete stranger I spotted in, in an airport in Kansas recently, wearing a picture of the amphitohedron. It was uh, one of these on-shell function pictures. And, uh, and perhaps a little bit over the line, but, um, but you know, to a certain special degree of enthusiasm. Uh, somebody online sent me a picture of their um, rendition of the Amplitude too. So I don't know if I've, been, if I've made you this enthusiastic, but um, I hope <laughs> a little bit more. Thank you very much. So I mean, yeah. So so in the last say six months or so, we now have closed formula for all processes at next to next to and next to next to next to leading order in QCD at leading weight and next to leading weight. So there's some extra little caveats around the edges, but things that were so in the last two years there have been a couple results at two to three and two two to four and two to three at two loops in QCD, and we now have closed formulas for all processes at two loops and at three loops um, in QCD. And basically any quantum field theory in four dimensions. But how about when you then look like um, I think the, the, the way forward is pretty simple. And I should actually I should clarify. So that some of this is um, unpublished. Um, I gave a talk last month here in Paris um, that, uh, that consisted of almost entirely unpublished results. Um, and this one is one that's um, uh, difficult to figure out how to publish it. Um, because it turns out that the two loop the statement that we can compute two loop amplitudes in QCD for all processes um, is was known. We found in the process of adding references that this was actually a known result. It just wasn't appreciated widely known. Um, and then we pushed it to three loops, and it got easy. So it turns out we can we can really push this forward. But the problem, the the real challenge to computing these things at higher loops is constructing this integrand basis. It's not. There's really no. The, uh, all of the work that you would need to compute something in n equals 4 at leading, which is a maximally transcendental theory, is the same amount of work that you would need for the leading weight part of QCD, um, or n equals 8, or any other quantum field theory. So there's a nice stratification of complexity according to the transcendental weight, um, the degree of these poly logarithms that come out. And at leading weight, I think it's much easier. It gets harder the deeper you go. The rational terms of the hardest. Um. So I had a, so one of the beginning stuff you used. I had the three questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, you, you talked about this map to the Grassmannian, and then there was some sort of integral structure lying there that you, know, you said that uh, it would uh, be present for any concept of theory that there would be a solution to something with this map. Mm -hmm. uh, what precisely did the map do? So uh, the. Um, <coughs> Oh, I don't know. I didn't claim it was integrable structure, but it, there's certainly aspects of it that seem integrable. So, and in the case of n equals four, I think you can make that map. In the case of n equals four, yeah. Sure. Um, so, I mean, a nice example of this is the difference between supersymmetric and non-supersymmetric uh, planar uh, gauge theory. So, the only difference between Q QCD and n equals four in terms of this, this, the collection of building blocks is that there's um, a graph theory dependent, uh, the spectrum of the matrix plays a role for, for an oriented graph in QCD. So the functions are exactly the same as n equals 4 with a finite number of orientations attached to them. Um, and these orientations are what's responsible for ultraviolet divergences at the, um, uh, in loop integration, and there's lots of interesting structure there. But at the integrand level, it looks a lot like n equals 4 times some prefactors that depend on the graph. Um, now these prefactors that depend on the graph change the form, so it cuts the infinite dimensional symmetry down a little bit. Um, so I should, I should clarify, so the reason why it's not obvious that these infinite dimensional symmetries have anything to do with amplitudes is because these building blocks have to get added together. 
And in n equals 4, you get to answer a, a very simple question, which is what is the space of symmetries that preserves all diagrams simultaneously? And that is, and that set of diffeomorphisms is called is the Yangian. Um, we showed this in, the, in one of the chapters in the book. Um, but if you go to something like uh, non-planar maximum supersymmetry or n equals 8, you still have these infinite dimensional symmetries term by term, but there's no easy way of answering what preserves them all. And maybe they have no intersection at all, and so there's no, in, no nice symmetries. So I, I don't want to say that QED, massless QED is integrable, but um, it might have more symmetries. That was, um, uh, I, I wish I did. Um, that was the, the, the paper that I wrote with Stephen last year was really the first in, along the lines to show that there was a connection. But um, uh, it's still, I guess, a speculation. I think that the structure of, of the, um, the, the CAC Moody algebra that you have in these the level generators looks a heck of a lot like the, uh, the structure that we have in the Yangian in the case of planar maximum supersymmetry. So I wanted to make this connection precise in that case, which would at least get, lend confidence to it being a real symmetry of real quantum field theories. But at the moment, uh, the best you, I mean, the only precise thing I could say is that we have two different reasons to expect that there might be more symmetries. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I do not know. I mean, there's something really nice about flat space. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so if you're, if you're a pessimist, there, so there are always reasons to, to, have, to have legitimate skepticism about all this, the nice things. So the nice things that we know are about four-dimensional theories. They're about massless particles in four dimensions in flat space. And when you start removing these things, bad things happen. But you know, the, but the, the scope of the badness is kind of manageable. Adding masses is, you can actually do in a reasonable way. There's a recent paper by Connie and Matt Clevers where they talk about this for massive theories. I mean, it actually goes back to earlier work by Albang and people. But um, ADS is another really great example where I think I, there's been very little work in that direction, but not because it's not interesting. I mean, and I don't, yeah. I would, I'm an optimist. I think there's something nice there. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a question from a different uh, field. Like in connects matter, when people does a field theory strongly about field theory, say of fermions, so yeah. uh, a way that people use to sum uh, diagrams is to uh, sample them. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something similar that can be useful, I guess, for the last part of your talk? Um, I mean, is there something, some strategy like this? This is called diagrammatic Monte Carlo. Yeah. Is that something that is being explored similarly? In, uh, I don't know. I don't know of any. So basically, instead of doing the integral, yeah. you do a Monte Carlo. On the, the diagrams. In the diagram space, yes. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I personally, at least, I'm, I've been kind of scared about non-perturbative things. Um, but th there have been some interesting results. And the, but the ones that I know about the most are in very much um, uh, Integrable systems or other other cases where we understand resummation in a better way. Um, so, but it's a great question whether, when you don't have a perturb perturbation the theory, I think we all kind of, or at least we're. The lore is that the asymptotic behavior of the perturbation theory tells you something about the non-perturbative completion, um, and maybe, and all that, the best I can say, is that. Uh, I hope that progress on the perturbation side will help inform that, but or test these uh, these ideas. But um, yeah, I really don't have anything to say. I wish I did. Yeah, just maybe something connected to this, and then something else. Uh, in that respect, well, picking up if I listen correctly, your method would be picking up graphs at random. I do worry about implied divergences in that case, and this for this particular example, right? That uh, well, if you take any Monte Carlo in QCD or in in, in quantum field theory, 
theories mm -hmm. typically just take all the bunch of, of divergences really and vertical together just to ensure that, that there is a cancellation between really and vertical turns at the poles. Mm -hmm. If you start just singling out one diagram out of the others, I, uh, my fear is that you'll, you'll get yeah. something which is unstable. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm, I'm maybe... I, I would really like... <laughs> well, I, yeah, maybe I shouldn't speculate. I mean, I think, I think there's a... Uh, at one loop, at one loop, there's a rigorous sense in which, for any infrared safe observable, you do not can be computed without expanding it into a basis of the divergent integrals. So you can really use finite integrals to compute finite observables. And um, I've actually thought about this more than I should have, and, it, and I've not succeeded at two loops. Just make a similar statement. Okay. Um, so I'm worried about divergences. Uh, I would love, it might very well be that you can calculate some finite observable without reference to divergent graphs. And that would be, that would at least help that problem. Um, but um, I don't have any reason to believe that such a basis, that uh, such a formulation exists. My question might be related to that. And again, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe it's something I've just misunderstood during the, during the seminar. Yeah. But there are some people trying to compute the, the infrared, the, the pure infrared behavior of, of, of scattering amplitudes. Yeah. And, and they find something very similar to these uh, to these polylogs. Well, they find polylog structures and all these all this, the very same objects. Yeah. I'm wondering whether the, there is a connection, an obvious connection that you see in what you compute here, uh, in particular in the case where you uh, where you said so at some point you were giving up the uh, some some power counting yeah. uh, that were being sometimes finite and sometimes. Uh, Infrared, well, infrared divergent. Yeah. If that shows up some of these structures in these in these decomposition, I'm optimistic that it will, but it's a little too new, so I, I don't I don't know the answer yet. Um, uh, this one one of the re I, I should have actually had a slide about this, but one of the things that I they, I'm, it keeps me really excited about amplitudes is that research is like triage. There are too many good questions, and I don't have enough time <laughs> yet. Um, but uh, that's that's a great question. All right. Jacob's going to be around till Thursday. Do you, do you remember your office number? Um, nope. It's right down the hall over there. Um, and so please feel free to stop by and, and engage him in any, any questions you have. Uh, and let's thank him again. <laughs>